Hello. This is a recording of a mini lecture on Clark Williamson's book, uh, Way of Blessing, Way of Life. And this is for the second week of class. So I'm going to go ahead and start the mini lecture. I hope that you had a good chance to read it. And we'll discuss this and some other issues as well in class. So this is a, an introduction, the first section really of Clark's book, Way of Blessing, Way of Life. And here's a picture of Clark. I think you probably have seen at least one of them. This is me and Clark a few years ago. Uh, for Clark, uh, it, it, his, his book reminds us and he, I think this is an important way of thinking about Clark's understanding of systematic theology. And that is that the essence of Christianity is the call, the hope to choose life and inclusive well being as God's blessing. I invite you to keep that in mind as you're reading through Clark's book and as you're rethinking and reevaluating your own understanding of constructive theology, your own view of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a pastor or a therapist, what it means to understand who God is, who we are, and what we are called to do from the, from the context of a, of a Christian in the 21st century. As you recall, we've talked a little bit about the way that, that uh, theology is understood as faith seeking understanding. And Williamson talks about this, defines this, and we'll talk some more about what this means. I mean, what do we mean by faith and what do we mean by understanding? And the different ways of interpreting theology or understanding the definition of theology. There's a, a different way of understanding that as well. This is the little bird who's very unhappy that I'm speaking in my professor voice. She wants to go. There she goes. Clark also says, uh, and this is another um, key to his understanding and his theology, is that faith is the dialectical relation between trust and mitzvah, obedience and questioning. I invite you to reflect upon what that means for him and what it means for you. This dialectical relation. It means that it faith and, and our relationship with God brings together two elements that are sometimes difficult to bring together. Um, being faithful, being trust, trusting in God, being obedient to God, but also having the chutzpah to question God when what our understanding of God is or what people are saying God says or does is goes against what our understanding of who God is. Theology is conversational for Clark Williamson. It's about a conversation that the church has with com the community, with its history, with its tradition, and with the world. Theology is also correlative. It connects the tradition and the message with today, with the questions and situations and issues that we face today. So this brings the thought reflection, which is what are the topics that, of significant conversations that theology ought to be having or that theology is having? What are the topics that come to mind in your theological thinking. Clark also makes a distinction. Um, it's a distinction and yet it's a understanding of the connection between witness and theology. And the church needs both witness and theology. The task of the Christian church is to witness to the essence which is demonstrated by the gospel of Jesus the Christ. And the task of the theologian is to think critically about the way that the church witnesses. So I encourage you to reflect upon 
the difference between what the church is doing, what the church is called to do, and what theology uh, as a particular element in the church is called to do, and the way that those witnessing and critically thinking about that witness and how it is growing and how what kind of impact and effects that that witness has what's the origin of the witness where do you get that witness from what are the sources authoritative sources and how do you know um, as you're acting on that witness how do you act on that witness and how do you critique or evaluate how that witnessing um, that work that you're doing in the world is if it's effective if it's appropriate to the christian um, the Christian tradition, the Christian norms, the Christian worldview, Christian values. So theology is about, the, I'm sorry, the church is about theology and witness, as I've just mentioned. You can look uh, to see some more of this information on page 24 forward. We do theology, he says, on the context of and behalf of the church and the world. So the witness of the church depends upon solid theology. And we witness out of the wisdom and clarity provided by good theology. In other words, solid theology of the church clarifies the inspired witness. I encourage you to reflect upon the relationship between uh, the, the witness and, uh, on, sorry, I encourage you to reflect upon the relationship between the church the church's work as witness and the church's work as theology. Sorry, there's something weird going on out there. I got distracted. For Williamson, theology is about the dialogue between God and life in a pluralistic world toward the way of life and blessing, the way of blessing and life abundant. This is really the core claim that he's making. And so everything that he's, every argument that he's going to make in this text is related to theology as a way of blessing and a way of life. Theologians are called to encourage ways for this dialogue that are true to the Christian tradition. So there's a consistency with the Christian tradition. These, um, this dialogue should also be in conversation with Jewish traditions and Jewish ways of understanding the, the Bible and who God is and who they are, or who we are as people and what we're called to do. Theo theologians are called to give interpretations of God, the world and us that are life-giving, that promote life and that avoid death dealing. So this is an important element in Clark Williamson's theology and his approach. He, he's very important for him to avoid death dealing. And he thinks that particular, in particular, uh, the way that Christianity has understood Judaism and Jews throughout its history has been death dealing. And there are other ways in which Christianity has been um, interpreted and proclaimed that are death dealing. And he wants us to be critical of those ways to get rid of, to, 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 uh, to get rid of those ways and to create a theology that is completely life-giving. His theology is also relational. He understands that God is definitely lives in a, that, that we live in a world that is relational, that it builds up freedom. So this upbuilding, which uh, some of you will remember from the intro to theology, how, how Kierkegaard talks about love being upbuilding, meaning that love assumes that we are already capable of love, that God assumes that we are already capable of love. And so the command to love our neighbor assumes we are already capable of doing that. We are already loved and capable of loving. And we are called, Kierkegaard reminds us, to see our neighbors, each neighbor, in those ways. That each neighbor, regardless of the way that they behave or the way that we have painted them, um, 
is capable of love. So Williamson's view is relational, it, it is upbuilding, and it also sees um, not just capable of love, but also is freedom. People are free and we are capable of creativity. And this freedom and creativity are particularly important and the interrelationality is particularly important. We'll talk a little bit about that as it's related to a process, theological perspective that he highlights, um, that he adapts. And lastly, theologians are called to encourage ways for this dialogue that addresses major forms of structural sin and systemic evil. And those include, we were talking about the death dealing ways. So that includes racism and sexism, militarism, um, violence uh, against the innocent and um, anti-Semitism or anti-Judaism. Now let's go back to the notion of what does the witness to Jesus the Christ entail? What does it mean to witness? What do you understand as the good news? Witness to the good news of Christ. Is it similar to Clark's understanding? These are questions for you to reflect upon. How do you or could you in your community, your church, witness to the good news of the gospel? To each other, to the world, in the world? I encourage you to reflect upon those questions. The answer to these questions is central to this course. So as we continue uh, in the course, I encourage you to return to these questions throughout. Note how your answers develop. Note what maybe your embedded answers are as you begin the course and how they change and develop or how you clarify uh, and be specific um, and perhaps change and correct your answers. These are your answers for you and your theology. Now, shalom is a really important element of theology for Williamson. And shalom is broader than simply peace. Um, peace, which could be the absence of war, the absence of conflict, but rather shalom is about what he says, uh, you know, how he understands it is really this inclusive well-being, this creative transformation toward inclusive well-being. That's one way of talking about shalom. And being true to our Christian tradition is to pass on the stories of our ancestors we want to pass on those stories, our ancestors from the, the Christian tradition, from the Jewish tradition, from perhaps our, an, our ancestors beyond that, in self-consciously critical ways that promote this shalom, that promote creative transformation toward well-being. Shalom is also about the interdependence of you and me with our neighbors, with strangers, with the environment, with those who are like us and those who are not like us, with all others, all of us working toward shalom. As I mentioned, Tillich, Tillich uh, Williamson also wants to avoid the death dealing ways of systemic injustices. He talks a lot about anti Semitism and anti Judaism, and this is particularly important and a virulent way of. Uh, and a way in which Christianity has participated in death dealing, so often it is embedded in our common theology. And I encourage you to reflect upon your common, your your own embedded theology, to see the ways in which there may be some implicit and embedded anti-Judaism, a blaming of the Jews for killing Jesus, or a a belief that somehow Christianity fixes what the problems were of, of Judaism. Perhaps this is a kind of supersessionism. We'll talk a little bit more about that as the semester goes on. Supersessionism is the notion that Christ and Christianity comes and supersedes or replaces God's covenant with the Jews, as if we can trust someone, a godly figure that just gives up the covenant 
that has lasted for three, four, five thousand years with a people and make a new one with a broader or different group of people. Other death dealing ways of systemic injustices include African American racism, as well as other forms of repression and oppression, environmental exploitation, classism such as the unjust distribution of resources, money, access, opportunity, sexism. Williamson affirms and is very clear that we need to have a theology that affirms women as full and equal human beings with the same status as men. And he also is concerned about the systemic injustice of militarism. This is a violent use of force to defend all these other injustices and perhaps others. But the last element of the, the reading for today is um, his discussion about revelation. He understands revelation as giving direction to the way, the way of God, the way of shalom, the way toward well being and creative transformation. God reveals God's self in God's works, in God's being and love. These are given by God in particular to whoever God chooses to receive them. And this is an important element for Williamson. We don't get to decide who is beloved and who gets the grace and who gets the favor if sometimes it feels like God is favoring some community or some individuals over others. It's up to God. Revelation is also uh, something that gets you going. So when God reveals God's self, it gets you going, inspiring action and creative transformation. When you have that experience of revelation, of this encounter with God in which God reveals God's self to you in an immediate and intimate way, it gets you going. Other important elements about revelation include that God's revelation is God revealing God's self to God's people, that scripture contains many disclosures of God's promises, God's presence, God's truth, and God's salvation. So that experience of God revealing God's self to us is salvation in itself. It is healing and transformative when we receive God's revelation, when we experience God's presence being with us in some kind of immediate way that is um, larger than the way that ordinarily happens, the way that it happens commonly for all. God's revelation includes stories about God's engagement with people, with God's people in the past, God's saving actions, God's um, sharing of Torah, which are basically instructions or ways for living. And they're ways for living, not just as here are the ways in which I want you to live, and so you'll be. Um, you'll accept my favor. It's more about ways of living so that you can become God's people. So that Israel, when Torah is given originally on, on the Mount Sinai, it's about God saying, I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. And here's a way in which you can be my people. Here's the Torah. Here's ways of living as a community. Here's ways of becoming a community that is focused on well-being, justice, love, making sure that everyone has enough, that no one has too much. Revelation also includes the prophets, times or, or uh, mouthpieces of God to remind us way, to remind us uh, the ways in which we have failed or we have gotten off course from the original covenant that we made with God and that God made with us about living the way that God is 
inviting, commanding us to live. Revelation also includes, and this is scripture I'm talking about here, um, historical records about who we've been, stories about our family, about our ancestors, about the ancestors that are in the biblical texts. It includes the gospels of Jesus. It includes letters and visions. Now, I encourage you to reflect upon the reading from um, Williamson, and um, we will talk a little bit about this um, when we get together, and that is uh, the notion of theological method. We talk about how revelation is this dipolar affair that includes this giving side and a receiving side, something that gets us going. We'll also talk about the norm of appropriateness. And this is not in the reading for today, but it'll be in the reading for next time. But that norm of appropriateness, that's a criteria by which we judge which parts of our authoritative sources are most significant and should be taken as um, authoritative when we are writing our theology. And that this norm of appropriateness is an ellipse. And we'll talk about that later, but it brings together love and justice, a love for each of us and justice for all. He also talks about revelation as being for the greater glory of God, not for what somebody in particular is trying to um, get an advantage. Uh, it is also a blessing for the poor, the oppressed, and those who are ignored. And one of the things that I encourage you to think about and reflect upon when you're thinking about revelation, thinking about scripture in, in the way that it has been interpreted, the way that you are interpreted, is who benefits from this interpretation and who is glorified in this interpretation. And we'll talk some more about that later. Uh, just as a reminder, our authoritative sources include scripture, which is a witness to God, and God's gracious love, I'm sorry, it's a witness to God's gracious love for Israel, for the church, for me, and scripture declares a love for all persons, and it bids us to love likewise. Tradition, he sees as a verb, it is the ongoing passing forward to upbuild other Christians. It helps us make sense out of claims that are in the Bible, it helps us make sense out of what's going on in the world uh, from a Christian perspective, from a religious perspective, perspective that holds God as being a part of the equation. Experience is also an authoritative source for uh, Williamson. God works in and through human sin and error. God knows that we're not perfect. God loves us anyway. God takes that into account. Uh, I raise the example of David and the way in which David in the Bible does things that are not things we should uphold and say, oh, yes, let's imitate David. But God still loves David and still holds David in high regard. Experiences also includes our own needs and our own insights our own religious insights, our own insights about what's really important and about who God is, about who we are and what we're called to do. A fourth authoritative source is reason. And he uses um, reason is, is broader than, than um, scripture. No, I'm sorry. Reason is broader than what we think is um, logical, um, it includes science as well. And um, he includes this inclusive well being as the criteria by which we judge all of these authoritative sources. So I invite you to um, reflect upon the reading for today. And um, if you have any questions, we can talk about that uh, when we get together. Thank you for your attention.